Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Capture the Flag Shakedown. Uh, we will go through what has occurred today, and uh, we'll actually replay the scenarios and look at uh, what you could have won. Now, notably, we didn't actually have any prizes today, and that was uh, intentional. So let's explain why that was and what has happened. Uh, hopefully, my screen should be sharing. We shall see. Okay, so uh, yes, we we had a CTF today. Um, hello and, and welcome. Thanks for your attendance. Uh, and hopefully this will leave you mildly entertained. So what were we doing today? Uh, today was a day of ambition. We aimed to educate, amuse, beguile, uh, and everything in between in a safe and happy environment. Uh, and we had the absolute pleasure of introducing people to the joys of container hacking. Scenarios are each built with a learning outcome in mind, and our capable taskmasters also constructed the scenarios, which gave us a little bit more closure um, on actually helping and giving hints to people as they went through. Um, notably absent from the list of goals is ranking. Uh, th this is because there's no official scores, there's no prizes, and the idea here is just to take the pressure off and to encourage people to go and hack stuff and to learn and to enjoy themselves breaking things in a safe and importantly legal environment. Although saying that, if you have captured uh, a flag or more um, and you'd like some, uh, some secret swag, then do DM a physical address to the nice taskmaster and uh, they will ship you something worthy of your efforts. Okay, so today was hopefully an exercise in preparing for the unexpected, thinking a little bit outside of the box, and uh, an encouragement that uh, nothing is entirely secure, and we should, uh, we should pay attention to these things. So we are in the uh, UK time zone on this end, so please bear with us. Um, it's been five o'clock for quite some time. We had six scenarios, one scenario per talk. So if you did the first scenario, it was concurrently running with the first talk and then consecutively throughout the day. Um, and uh, lots of talking, but nefarious, small and uh, potentially mild vulnerabilities. Unless, of course, uh, someone did better than we bargained for and uh, the AWS bill will be significantly higher than we thought. So there are many places to look for vulnerable clusters, but we believe the only way to upskill people is to give them a safe place to practice in. So instead of going on a uh, cluster safari, we prefer to run CTF-based training, but capture the flags can often be daunting, big, challenging, filled with the kind of people who we, uh, we look up to, and we want to break those barriers down and give everybody the opportunity to, to be involved. So we hope there's been a strong first user experience. Um, there's attentive moderators in the channels and teaching assistants, and uh, yeah, we just want to give people a boost on their cloud native journey. So, uh, spoiler alert, um, if anybody is still playing, your time is up and we will uh, not be validating any flags after this point. Uh, so let's go through the scenarios and find all the flags now. Um, excuse me while I shuffle my screens. Okay, so the first scenario um, was uh, called Node Secret Breach. So uh, back to the screen share, hopefully. Okay, so uh, what happened here? Well, first of all, uh, we start, we're starting as the root user, and this is... Uh, this is mixed, of course. Um, root has a, a special set of privileges. In Linux, the root user is a specific and special user. That means it has capabilities, and those capabilities may include things like changing other people's files or opening a network adapter in uh, a, a low-level mode so we can just 
either send custom packets or turn it or set it into a different mode so we can sniff stuff on the network. These are not things we'd want an average user to do. And so the distinction of running in a container without using namespaces is important at this point. Um, so let's see what else is in this container. Uh, let's have a look around. Well, this is what we expect, right? We've got a process namespace, so we can only see the processes that we have available to us. Uh, what else might we do? Um, we might have a look around and see what else is mounted. Um, this is kind of noisy. There's not really much here that's that's useful. There are a few things. Anytime we see uh, a Docker uh, or perhaps uh, one of these mounts, they, they, they could be interesting. So uh, DF, the disk free tool, is a little bit of a quicker way to get a view on this, in, in my opinion. And um, of course, we see a service count there. Service counts are juicy, and uh, we are people that love messing around with service counts. On this occasion, though, um, this was not a service account based challenge. And uh, OK, so we've had a look what's running. Uh, sorry, we've had a look what's mounted within the container. Um, th there's a lot here, but some of the things, notably uh, a, a device from the host, um, uh, other stuff that doesn't look like it's inside the container. Well, that's because containers are wonderful, but they're not a perfect abstraction. And that concretely means that container runtimes have to put effort in to hide certain things from us. And those things may include parts of the proc file system, bits of sys, the way that we interact with the process table, uh, and, and also the way that things are mounted in. So, uh, OK, um, containers are a child of evolution um, rather than intelligent design. And like everything else on the internet, our gaffer tape together, uh, no disrespect to the people who've done an excellent job making them available to us. Um, OK, but, but enough of this. There's a lot of noise here. We want to get some signal. Uh, let's think about what we can do with the service count. Right, so we can see that dev is here. So, so what does this mean? So Docker will mount in Etsy hosts using the mount point from the host that it's on. So wherever you store your container images, those read-write layers, that's where this is. So already the abstraction has leaked um, with the file system here. What do we do next then? Well, I guess it's probably worth uh, checking our privilege. Now, there is a canonical way of doing this, uh, which is Jesse Frizzell's Am I Contained, of course. It's not doing anything magic. It's checking states and files that are available to us inside a container. But it makes it very easy for us to do and gives us a unified view. So let's try and do that. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that we are root, and that means that we have the ability to run package manager commands. We need to be able to write to any location on the file system, so we have to be root to do this generally. And uh, yeah, there we are. So just install curl, because without curl, I'm going to have trouble pulling in stuff from remote endpoints. Although, of course, any programming language is an interpreter, and most can be used to replicate curl in some way. So let's pull am I contained from GitHub, chmod it, and run it. Happy days. OK, so we've got some stuff here. What does this say? Uh, we're in Kubernetes. Does it have namespaces, PID namespace? Generally, that is always true anyway. User namespace is generally always false, because user namespaces are, are not enabled, I suppose, by default in, uh, in run C or in Kubernetes. This is interesting, though. We're unconfined in AppArmor. Now, if we were running in Docker, that would always have a profile. Kubernetes, of course, disables this. And uh, so it's just reinforcing the fact that we're in Kubernetes, but it doesn't tell us anything uh, too drastic. This, however, what is this? This is uh, a wide bounding set of capabilities. So stuff in here, this means we can change ownerships, override discretionary access control, which is um, basically writing on other people's files. Uh, and all sorts of things in here that we recognize, um, processes being killed, um, raw input and output, access to the network adapters. This is pretty likely to be a privileged container. 
Okay, so we know what that means. That means that actually what is in dev is a reflection of what's on the host. So as a reminder, the privilege flag, uh, the most dangerous flag in the history of computing, as I will oft repeat, disables most namespaces. It turns off app armor and set comp if they're enabled. It grants all capabilities and it mounts all of the host's devices into the container. This is a bad day for a system administrator. Why? Because we can say, all right, we know which disk is mounted from the host. So let's uh, mount that disk into an empty mount directory. Okay, so this is probably not what we were hoping to see because if we were a uh, blue team, um, because that's what the root of the containers file system partition looks like. Whereas what we've mounted in from the root, uh, let's go back to there, what we've mounted in from the host contains extra stuff. And lo and behold, it contains a directory called node secrets. This may be obvious. Oops, let's, uh, let's actually, yep, go in there. Uh, and there we go. So there is our first flag. The disadvantages of running privileged containers are that they are equivalent to running the process on the host. There is essentially no containerization going on when we run privileged. And uh, yes, run for the hills if uh, that's the kind of thing you are trying to defend because it's more or less indefensible. Okay, that was the first one. Um, next, we have uh, escalate uncover secrets. And... Let's jump in. So uh, this alias will just take me into the um, into the next host. Okay, let's spend a bit more time looking at what's happening here. So um, we're in the uh, the attack container, um, and escalate and cover secret. SRE has deployed a Postgres daemon set and a new pod for monitoring the processes in your cluster. Following a routine audit of an application, it is believed that the deployment setup allows a compromised process audit pod container, a mouthful, to escalate its attack to other containers on the host. This doesn't sound like it makes sense. There's obviously something a little bit askew here. Okay, so the, the question then is, verify this by uncovering both the Postgres database password and the secret key. We will start in the process audit pod. Okay, so um, first of all, we know that it's possible to provision secrets via environment variables. This is um, this is something that the Twelve Factor app has told us historically. But as we know, the environment of a process leaks to other users of the system, and so we actually prefer to provision passwords with a with a file and an environment variable as a as a pointer containing the path of that file. So, I mean, the first place to start here um, then is probably just looking at the environment. Let's just see what is in here. Okay, well, there's actually nothing particularly juicy in here. And uh, because we know, I'll just go up and, because we know that the, uh, that the flag has a specific format at this point, um, we can use that string to, uh, to just grab through the env. We haven't missed anything. There's nothing there. Okay, um, so we're supposed to be, uh, let's just remind ourselves, this audit, this process audit pod, and we're looking to understand what the database adjacent to us is doing. So let's just see what we've got running. Okay, this is a red flag uh, for a Catalonian festival. We should not be seeing this many processes because as we saw, I'll just go back up to where we were earlier, as we saw in the process table, excuse me, it's further than I thought, the process table here for the container, which is um, isolated to itself, we're only seeing a very small number of, of processes. And notably, we see PID1, which is not systemd or an init system. It's just a sleep command. So that's what we would expect to see. But actually, we can see all sorts of things. We can see stuff on the host. Uh, so this is, again, a, a remarkably bad day. Um, the question here, though, is not how we uh, we take over the host, although from, from here it's um, not especially difficult. We still want to exfiltrate those, um, those those crucial bits of data, the secret and the key. 
Uh, okay, so this is probably how we traversed containers because we shouldn't be able to see the process list. The things we can, let's list it uh, in its fullest extent and have a look for Postgres. Okay, so we found Postgres. And just to be clear, this is Postgres running in a container on the same host. What we're seeing here is a host PID namespace share. And this, again, is um, of questionable repute as a practice. There is some necessity for it, but we should always be careful when disabling a container security feature or a container primitive, like host namespaces for networking or PIDs, um, or even mounting stuff in, that we're breaking the container abstraction by adding stuff or taking stuff away. Uh, really, we want to be locking it down and not sharing stuff further with other workloads on the system. Okay, so, um, right, we've got a PID for Postgres, and we can also see the Postgres, uh, we, we can also see the PID. So uh, let's do some magic proc diving. So if we go into proc and we put the PID in there, then uh, let's start off um, just looking at the command. Okay, so a, a foible of proc is that everything is uh, is null terminated. So in order to just get a bit of visibility into what's actually happening here, let's uh, replace null with uh, just space this time. Okay, so we can see that it's just been invoked as Postgres. All right, no problem, that's, uh, that's sound enough. But what else is in proc? Um, I, I'll give you a clue. The environment and at this point even though that looks like a mess of junk let's see if we've got there is our flag so again using the flag ctf grep when there's a well-known flag string um, can help because otherwise it's a kind of indeterminate mess of uh <laughs> of black and white that's a little bit difficult to pick things out of okay one down so that is uh that is a flag but if we go back to the beginning of this scenario, we were told uh, there is more than one flag. So I'm covering both the database password and the secret key. Okay, so we know we've got the database password, but there's a secret key. We don't have any access to that adjacent Postgres container, except for through the, the proc table. Okay, so what else can we do with proc? we can examine the root file system mounted into that container. Let's do it with uh, LL instead. Okay, so it's a symlink. Um, we don't mind too much about that. Here we go again. We have got into the file system of a container running on the same machine as we are. So we've got into the mount namespace essentially without having access to the container itself. Uh, if we go into secrets, we can see that there is something that looks like a key there. And if I have read line, there we go. Okay, that is key number two. Um, I'm conscious of time and I will try and keep on clipping. Um, I, th so the point here is that there is a real risk with enabling username, um, sorry, process namespaces. And uh, yes, w while it's necessary, obviously the feature was shipped um, for a reason we should be cognizant and of course everything should be threat modeled and then we can balance the impact of that thing actually being breached or negatively affected or or exfiltrated with the benefit that we get from using it in the way that it was intended. Okay, on we go and we're into a CI server vulnerability. Right, so what are we doing here? Uh, we're pen testing a cluster, we found a vulnerability uh, the pod is part of the build infrastructure. As we know, uh, build infrastructure is a juicy target. Uh, supply chain security is a, uh, a particular interest of, uh, of, of SIG security and the Cloud Native Security Day uh, of which we are a part. And so build infrastructure, yeah, that's okay. That's of interest to me. Uh, all right, what's happening then? We're concerned that a compromise may lead to leaked secrets. Okay, so we want to extract the secret key and uh, looks suspiciously like we are in a Jenkins flavored pod. <sighs> okay, so, so again, we kind of just want to do a bit of recon. Let's just figure out what's what's going on. Process table's okay. Uh, the mount namespace. So again, there's a couple of things here that 
jump straight out. One is a service account. Um, and of course, we can do the same thing again looking here, but nothing really jumps out from there immediately. Uh, that to me, again, is just a little bit of a mess. Um, the thing that jumps out for me here is not the service count. It is the presence of the hallowed Docker socket. A socket is uh, an inter-process communication mechanism, um, amongst other things. And in this case, it means that we can probably talk to the Docker daemon whose socket is mounted into the pod, which we're probably safe to assume belongs to the Jenkins host. Um, now, at this point, we would hope that Docker is installed. Uh, we would probably check, uh, see the kernel is nice and recent. Okay, that's all good. See what release we've got. Okay, it's all relatively recent. So we assume probably that we can install Docker through the package manager, but we can also do something via a backdoor because we have curl. So let's just pull the official Docker installer. Um, maybe we'll, we'll free ourselves from bugs in Docker itself. Uh, although those days are much further behind us. Um, but it's nice to be on the latest version, isn't it? Even if we're going to break stuff, let's do it with uh, correct operator practices. All right, so we're installing the Docker client in the expectation that we can use it to abuse the Docker socket. We could just send RESTful commands over the Docker socket, but it's a bit more long-winded. And uh, right, so what we see here is the Docker version command has given us the client and the server. Happy days. So let's see what's running here. There is a lot. And of course, we see Kubernetes. Oops, uh, let's do color in the US spelling always. Yeah, and then we see Kubernetes all over the place. So it's probably, again, not a good day for somebody. Um, in this case, we uh, probably want to look in the Nginx container. He says, so let's, um, let's have a look in here. If we do a Docker inspect, in fact, we can do it more elegantly with the, um, the containers sure. Okay, again, there's a lot of information here. We can kind of spool through it. But because we're vol hunting and we, uh, well, we're flag hunting, I suppose, and we know the flag again. Sweet. There we go. There is our secret access key. That looks, so let's have a look at some context around that. Um, and colorization is always useful. Okay, so what's happened? The environment of the container has specified this environment variable. So we're back into environment variables again. Not only do they leak on the host on which they are running, but also they leak from uh, metadata about the thing. As you see in this case, it is an insecure provisioning method because um, it's either set at runtime or set in the image itself, ideally not, of course. So really what we want here is, um, is to instead point that secret to a file. And this is as Kubernetes will do with a secret file mount for us, and that way, we, we need to have access not only to, to, the, uh, to, to the container's metadata like this, but also the container itself, or as we saw previously, the process table, um, et cetera. Right, at this point, um, we had pretty good, um, I, I would say turnout. We, we, had, we had a lot of people, we'll, uh, we'll get to those numbers at the end, but also a lot of people got through these scenarios and, uh, and at this point, most people were still, still with us. So let's persist. Next, we have um, a non-user compromise. Okay, and out and back in again. Okay, so what we're we doing here? Um, more uh, escalation sideways. Um, so uh, j just moving laterally through um, through Kubernetes or maybe actually on the, uh, yep, on multiple nodes. So, okay, so secrets have been extracted from the cluster. We're in a post-mortem phase, but it's not clear how the anonymous user managed to escalate sideways after the initial breach. So let's try and replay the intrusion from inside the cluster. Okay, so we're in the pod that was breached, excuse me, and we're going to replay what the, what the, what we expect the attacker did. Um, now, again, we've got our 
um, our kind of basic recon, which is just seeing uh, how's our process table. Uh, do we have anything spare or extraneous mounted in here? Um, we can go to the map points for the whole system. Uh, we can install Ammo Contained and see what our bounding set is. Uh, but in the interest of time, uh, this is uh, this is slightly different. So at this point, we are attacking things that are outside our domain. Uh, uh, sorry, outside our namespace, let's say. And we have got the IP addresses of the nodes. So what runs on a Kubernetes worker node? Well, there's the kubelet, there's kubeproxy, there may be things for the CNI as well. The kubelet has some configurations that um, are, are less than optimal, let's say, uh, such as the, uh, the read-only port. So let's just see if we can find anything. Excuse me for my mouse constantly doing that. Um, in and around here. So uh, again, I know what I need to use in advance, so I will just install it. Uh, but we need to do an app update uh, and get curl and JQ. So what are we actually doing here? Let's just see if we can access these host nodes. So let's go um, up in here. And as a reminder, this is a network route from the pod onto the public interface of the host. And really, there's not a great deal of rationale for, um, for, for running like this. Uh, we should be using network, uh, network policy and, um, yeah, frankly, constraining our outbound traffic so that we can't hit anything at all, start with the default deny and, uh, and then upgrade. Okay, that was smooth. Let's just install that too. So as you can see, I'm having to install a lot of software as I go along. That's kind of standard. There is uh, generally we don't ship curl and that kind of thing to production because why would we unless we needed it for our application? But as an attacker, I am able to install stuff inside the container really just by setting a, a non-root user, uh, maybe even removing the package manager if needs be, that makes for a much safer day, let's say. So JQ and curl, if I installed those, what did I get wrong there? Nothing. <laughs> okay, and uh, let's um, skip verifying the certificates. Okay, that means that we can read from the kubelet. And we can see lots of things that are running here. And what we care about uh, potentially is something um, compromise-ish. So let's have a look. Uh, nope, there's nothing in there. Uh, now that probably means that what we're looking for is on the other node. So let's just remind ourselves which nodes were which. And switch over. Happy days. That is the pod that we are looking for. Okay, so now we have more information about what we're looking to attack. So what should we do with that? Well, let's see if we can dump the env of this um, this pod. So the pod is um, where is it going to be? The workload pod there. And then, if you will just excuse my copy pasta one second. And this won't quite work because of the node IP. So let's just replace. Node IP is the one we've just used, which is the second one. Okay, so we're posting a command. Oops. Uh, okay, so we're posting to the node IP, um, force of habit, <laughs> uh, on the insecure, uh, on the read-only port rather. And uh, we, want, we want to go into this pod and then run the print env command. Okay. Um, joy of all joys. That is not coming back with anything. Have I done something wrong? Um, I guess the pod name should be pod name and not pods. That was a great relief to me. And as we go again, there is our flag. 
happy days. Okay, let's uh, steamroller on through the rest of these. Um, we are on to pod breach extract, and for this, I will pass over to my uh, worthy companion, Magno. Hi, everyone. I think you need to stop sharing, Andy. Okay, thank you. The scenario here that we have for the for the CTF uh, is the, the pod uh, pod British tract, right? So in this scenario, let me just um, look in again here. Uh, uh, Verify your suspicion by breaking to the pod and extract the value of user cred's password, right? So, and, and your starting point here, you start on a virtual machine external to the cluster, right? So, so how, how do you get access to, to the cluster, to the pods of the cluster itself, right? So, um, basic things here in, in the interest of time, uh, I'll, I'll Good. Uh, so first thing, if if I need to access that uh, that server or that service, right? I, I need to. Uh, I don't I don't have the credentials, right? So I need to uh, first do like a. your your server make sure that everything is okay i ran this before just before uh the example just to make sure that uh everything is, is uh running smoothly and we don't need to download it again so uh and and here one of the, the tools that you can use to to do that to do the network uh, uh mapping and scanning is nmap right so Thank you. You will now be placed into Okay. Okay. Uh, can you guys hear me again? Uh, my screen sharing. Screen sharing. Yeah.
Hi, can you hear me? Can you guys give me some feedback on the chat? Oops. Yeah, okay, sounds good, awesome. Uh, yeah, so as I was saying, sorry about technical difficulties here. Um, so as I was saying, we install Nmap there. And another, uh, one of the things that we can do is to run Nmap on this uh, specific node port IP that was provided to us for this challenge, right? Okay, and I've selected a few ports here so the scan doesn't take forever, right? So specifically for uh, just the demonstration here, uh, and we can see that there is a port open on, on this higher port here, uh, 30022, right? So one of the things, uh, and it's very famous on, on, on pen testing and, and like uh, application security scenarios is uh, brute forcing, right? So one of the attacks that you can run, uh, you can get a list of username and password then try to just uh, brute force the system to guess those credentials, right? And one of the tools that you can use here for, for brute forcing uh, this, uh, this port and, and, and access the service, right? So uh, I don't know exactly from the end map there, I don't know exactly which server it is, but I can, uh, I think I can run this one, let's see if it's gonna give us to us a little bit more information there. If it takes too long, then I can just move on. See here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we can see that this service, right? So it was showing on the first scan, was showing as unknown, right? So I ran, uh, I added the flag dash a, a here, so to scan the services and the versions as well. So we know that this port is running an open SSH server there, and and then uh, now I can try to uh, to brute force it, right? passing a list of username and passwords, right? So one of the tools that you can easily do that is called Hydra. Uh, and uh, the way to install it, just typing, oops. Okay. Okay. Type in this command here, uh, oops. Yeah. Type demos. Okay, so I have Hydra installed already just to show you guys here. Um, and now what I need to run this brute force, right? I need a list of username and passwords, right? Uh, one, one of the, the very common uh, uh, list of passwords is the Rockio list. So you could have downloaded that and use it. But this server, this, this server here is not very protected. So the, the password is not, the username and the password are not very hard. Um, so I created a list uh, here already on, on this server uh, called the list of users. So I have a list of usernames here, and I have a list of passwords that I could try so it doesn't take forever when running, right? So here's the command that I'm going to use for Hydra to uh, try to brute force this, uh, this username and password on this server location here. Uh, let me just show you guys. Uh, so just moving on here so we don't lose uh, a lot of time. We're almost running out of time here. Uh, basically, if you run this command, you should get the uh, the results. I had it here before. Oh, no, I I, I really... Uh, okay, sounds good. Sure, uh, almost done. Uh, so, yeah. Basically, just 
after I find out the username and password, I can access this server. Oops. Yeah, we should copy and paste here. And so the the user is admin and the password is password. Very, very easy for you guys. You know, even if you don't have like a tool, you could uh, try guessing and access that. Okay, so I'm inside this called jump box, right? So what I'm gonna do here is try to uh, connect to the API server and make some requests. So base, base, the, the base request here that I can make is to check the version of the, the Kubernetes API server. This is one of the ways to do that, right? So I can see that's running uh, version 119.4, stuff like that, right? So just to wrap up here, uh, one of the things that I can do is, uh, as, as Andy mentioned before, uh, there is some um, secrets and tokens inside the pods, right? So I can grab that and, and use to impersonate uh, the pod to talk to the API server, right? So basically here, what I'm gonna do is just create two variables, the namespace, uh, telling that's uh, located at var run secrets, kubernetes.io, service account namespace. And I'll do the same thing for the token here, cube token. Okay, almost done. Uh, and then now I can make, a, if I have uh, permissions to do that, I can make a request to this namespace and uh, through via the API server and ask for the secrets. And since this is a misconfigured cluster, I have the permissions. Uh, so here, just just making this API, let me show that again, right? So this is the, the request that I made and I can see all the secrets. And here is the flag, user creds, password, and, and that's it for this challenge. Uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to Andrew again. So thank you, guys. Bye. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, let's zoom through the ends of the slides. Uh, there was one more scenario um, which people didn't quite get to. So um, if you would like a, a go at that, then uh, do feel free to DM. Right, let's get through to the end. So uh, this was... This was the control plane team at uh, seven o'clock this morning. Um, we are just about through the other end of it. So honorable mentions, thank you to these individuals for uh, being with us through most of the journey today. And um, <laughs> we, we had a great time on DMs, it's fair to say. Uh, there some really, uh, people showed some real grit and persistence and, uh, and that's what it's all about. So good job, those people. Um, we have some honorable mentions as well. Um, Dilshan, Matthias, Michael, Mathieu, Walid, Steve, Mohammed, and Noel were all there for the whole journey. And thank you very much for your efforts in parting the uh, container defenses. Um, various people enjoyed themselves slightly. Uh, and uh, I, I hope this has been a beneficial learning experience. I'm sorry there was no cake. And thank you very much to the control plane uh, people at this end for, for manning everything and to Magno for all his assistance in helping us out and testing, etc. This is a public service announcement. We don't run administrative endpoints on the public internet. The Kubernetes API server is one of them. If you like what you saw today, control plane, do this for a living and uh, we'd be happy to uh, stand up a CTF for you. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you to everybody who contributes today. We had a total of 327 clusters spun up. Uh, that is about 15,000 nodes. Um, we had uh, a peak of 73 users. So thank you to everybody who played and um, we welcome all and any feedback. Uh, have a wonderful day. <laughs>